Hello. So we decided to look at the various feature points that a patient comes in with when they're admitted to hospital within the first 24 hours. There's, there's a multitude of them. Whether you're a clinician or a non-clinician, you can appreciate that we've got lots of blood tests, lots of observations, lots of past medical history that we filter through and we get lots of data about patients. So we wanted to know, can we build a simple model to take collections of those features and predict length of hospital stay and how sick patients end up getting during the hospital stay? How simple can make Exactly, so how simple can that model be? And as we go through um, the patient pathway, we meet lots of doctors, we meet lots of nurses who apply various scoring systems. And then you're looking at the slide things, it looks noisy, and it's noisy on purpose, and that's the point. It's all these scoring systems on MD Calc, which is where we find a lot of them, become very, very noisy. A lot of G doctors might not know about all of them. Um, applying all of them in the right context, applying all of them correctly, gets really tricky. So we have an over-reliance on scoring systems. I think a lot of clinicians would, appear, would agree with that. Um, this can impact on patient outcomes. So the, the impetus for this project came from thinking about the NIHSS score, which is a, a stroke classification um, system that classifies whether people need to go for clot-busting drugs or not. But doing these wrong have an impact on patient, uh, patient outcomes, whether they get those drugs or not. We tend to use guidelines as train tracks rather than letting them direct us and give us suggestions. And we wanted to think about the process of building these scoring systems, given that, that we live in an era where we have large amounts of big data. How do we build these models better? How can we build a unified model better? With high dimensional data, but moves away from small patient populations where we're building scoring systems that are specific for those patient populations and move towards scoring systems or a way to score in general that combines all that data together. Because what we find if we go back to the previous slide, which we don't necessarily have to do, but all of, a lot of these different scoring systems use very similar metrics. So are they essentially testing the same thing? Can we combine them? So, this idea is not new. I think just be that, but I think we're out of time. Okay. Um, Let, let's keep going. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Okay. So, so essentially, the frailty index is a way that you can measure how well someone is without having a big set of rules. So, um, you, know, you might have scores like the Mel score for liver disease, you might have a new score for pneumonia. With a frailty index, what you do is you just make a measure of how frail someone is which is what, what geriatrician calls it, or an anesthetist might call it an ASA score. I would argue these are all measuring the same concept. They're measuring like a general measure of just how of someone's health. And the frailty index is a way of doing that. And historically, frailty index has been like, you must use these features in your frailty index, and the most famous frailty index that we saw was EFI, which is a frailty index made for primary care. But a frailty index, what you do is you just take some features in the health record. So that could be, do they walk the walking stick, or could it be, have they got a normal ECG? Have they got a normal chest x Have they got a normal potassium? And you just combine those features together, you divide how many of their features are abnormal by how many features you sample, and if a feature's missing, you just don't include it. So it can deal with missing data, which almost all these other algorithms can't, because they need all the data to be complete, which is a big problem in data science. So what we wanted to do is to see um, how changing the number of features and changing the minimum number of features that you needed affected the performance of your um, data. And you see, when you have loads of features and you say a high minimum, you actually have this lovely normal distribution with the priority index. It doesn't really matter what the features you select are. We've selected ours in our data based on which we thought the most impactful. Um, and you see some nice um, properties, like you can't really have a frailty index above 0.7, no matter what you select. Like once that many Jenga blocks have been removed, your tower cannot stand. But what we want to do specifically on this hack day is to see what's the minimum number of features we can get to still have a viable um, frailty index. So we. We then plot on the next slide, we've made, I know these are difficult people who aren't medics, but these are called Kepler-Mars survival curves. And what we've got, we've got four lines. 
the red line is the sickest person, and the bottom line is the wellest person, according to our priority index. And then we've looked at how long these patients stay in hospital for. And as you can see, even with the priority index, with only 10 features and a minimum of two, you have a nice separation and a p-value of less than 0.01 for predicting somebody's length of stay in hospital. Um, obviously, if you make your features more and you have more minimum features, you have much nicer separation. And you can do the same thing. So, uh, this is definitely nice. Thank you, Reeves. Right. Questions from the panel? Any questions? Can I go to the floor first? Any questions from the floor? Um, hi. Um, I'm interested in understanding what your um, metric for success is here in terms of um, uh, the frailty uh, in, in disease. Um, what's the better frailty index? Like? There are lots of different ways to measure the success of uh, an index like this, some sort of prediction like this on there. Yeah, so I think people in medicine are really obsessed with, with predictive capability, and I'm less obsessed with that. People like to know what's the AEC of the score, it, how high they, what's your outcome of interest, what's your AEC, how good are you predicting that? I, the, what inspired me with this is, is I, I was on call at, at um, Queen Elizabeth Hospital as a medic on call, and I was supposed to have five SHOs and only two turned up. And we had 40 patients and patients need to be seen on the weekend, and it was clear that we weren't going to see all 40. And what we ended up having to do was spend two hours at the beginning of Saturday morning going through every single electronic health record of every patient to triage the ones that need to be seen. If we just had a score like this available in the notes, I could just sort by that column, and then that would save me two hours of work. So, for that to be successful, you want the rank order that it's given you to be, be good, so you need some sort of. Yeah, so, why, why, so this, to be honest, this is, this is part of my PhD. Um, I'm doing my PhD. <laughs> Uh, and, and it was Josephine's idea, and I, I, I feel like I might have slightly uh, taken over. But my goal to evaluating this would be to, um, my plan to ask for clinicians, I'm going to make 20 patients randomly set to come over to the health record, ask clinicians to, uh, maybe 10 clinicians to rank them in order, and then also use a, this, a priority index is one way, I think there's other ways of doing it, make, make algorithms do it, and then see if it's possible to distinguish the human from the algorithm. And I think if it's impossible to tell which ones are over and which ones are over here, I can say that's a mark of success of how good these are at doing that task. But I think you need clinician buy-in to do that. That's one of the big dangers. I think implementability is key. And at the moment, we only want to implement things that have a high AUC, really, and, and have been published in a big journal. And how do you get stuff like this published when people aren't interested in it if you don't have those big sort of markers and take care of them? Something that's really yeah. easy to ask a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next, by the way, is TRX platforms. So, get ready. Hi, thanks, Bridges. I'm just curious how, because I can really easily fake a good ROC score. It's very easy to train a model to get a good yeah. ROC score. So, my question here is how do you tackle and what are you going to put in place to make sure that you have build up good prediction models that limit bias and all those consequences of building? Bad models. Okay. So having a good well, I've just, I've just had a paper. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've just written a uh, like a letter to the editor of uh, of Lancet Digital Health about this, which has been rejected. But I've now resubmitted to another journal, so it may be impressed. So the longer answer there. I, I think AROC is a terrible. I think supervised machine learning in AROC is a terrible way to train models because you have with with this one, for example, you have a massive problem here with 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 um, Bias. So, just to quickly use a uh, an example of new scores, people want to make things like this to, to replace new scores. They say new scores are rubbish because people with high new scores don't die, and people die with low new scores. Uh, therefore, new scores are rubbish. We're going to make a new, better new score by putting more features in. We're going to put hundreds of features into our into our score. We're going to train it on retrospective data. We're going to say that patients who go to, who die or go to ICU, we want to identify them and their, our score will trigger for them, and patients who don't die go to, go to IT don't want to see those. But that process misses the person who gets a new score of 15, gets seen by an SHO, the SHO gives them some antibiotics and fluids, and then they don't die, and then they get better. But in that supervised paradigm, we never train on that patient. We say that patient, we don't want to identify that patient, because in our data set, they didn't die and they didn't go to ICU. So we end up making an algorithm that only spots patients that die or go to ICU, and that's not what we want, because they might have just died anyway. We want people to go to ICU who are going to get better, 
not people to go to ICU who won't get better. So that whole paradigm of an AUC and retrospective data, I think, is completely flawed. Uh, and hopefully, a journal editor will agree with me and publish my article. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Quick publication.